So I'm Matt Scales, as Matt said, uh, and I'm here to talk about uh, the platinum elements. Um, the platinum elements are our way to help uh, to make using the latest and greatest web platform features easy with Polymer. Um, so the web is getting a lot of really cool features recently, um, and this is great for users, it's great for developers, and it's also great for um, businesses that want to be able to uh, do exciting new things without tethering themselves to uh, a closed platform. Um, but it's also getting complicated. There's a lot to learn now. Um, and realistically, you can't learn all this stuff anymore. Um, now, these, um, these new features are actually they're so powerful because they're very deep. Um, so what can we do about this? Well, luckily, there's an element set for that. Um, so what we've done is we've created the platinum element set. And the idea here is that these elements wrap these uh, complex APIs and provide the, uh, the most obvious use cases um, simplified out so that you can uh, just drop them in. Um, so the, um, the platinum elements, uh, most of the features that we're wrapping here are only implemented in a, a few browsers, um, pretty much just Chrome, actually. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, the platinum elements themselves, if you drop them into your page, um, they will just uh, gracefully degrade um, if you use them in a browser that doesn't support them. All of these features are enhancements. Um, the traditional web has always happened in a tab. Um, and these features are allowing you to break out of the tab and do things um, outside of that environment. So we're going to talk about um, offline, push messaging, and device access. So first up, offline. Um, <clears throat> so when I say offline, really what I mean here is removing your dependency on the network. Um, so in order for your app to work offline, you need to have all the resources for your app on the device. And this is a huge performance uh, boost, even if you actually have a good connection. Um, there are lots of people who have um, no connection for various parts of the day. I commute through London on the underground train, and I, I don't get any connection there. There are also lots of people with just bad connections. Um, so as another part of my commute, I go through the countryside on a train, and I have pretty bad 2G for big portions of my commute. And I live in a you know, first world country <laughs> in, in a huge uh, city. Um, so. This problem only gets worse when you go to uh, remote places or um, emerging markets. Um, and as I say, this actually will improve the speed even on a good connection. You don't have to go to the network at all for a lot of these things. <clears throat> now, a lot of people, they're not quite sure how this will work for their app. Surely it's on the web because it needs the network. And that's a good point. Um, so offline takes different forms for uh, different applications. So here we have a simple, this is actually a Google Doodle. It's a crossword. This can be entirely offline. There's no online component here at all. You put all the resources in the local cache, you load them all up, um, everything will just work. So this is a very good um, case. Something like Gmail, obviously that's, that's network-based, right? But there are, there are things you can use. You, there's the app shell, um, all of the user interface, uh, the new message box here. And obviously, you can cache messages that have already been downloaded so that the user can still read them even while offline. And the same here applies here to something like um, a chat app or something like that. And then worst case scenario, your app really, really just needs to be online to do anything. You at least can control that offline experience. You can put up your own branding, your own message. Um, you know, maybe uh, you, so if you, by default, in Chrome, you get the little offline dinosaur. And if you click it, you get a game. You could put your own game, you know, <laughs> something, something to do with whatever it is that your, your business is about. What does this have to do with Polymer? Well, there's an element for that. <coughs> Uh, specifically, Platinum SW, or the set of Platinum SW elements. Um, the SW here stands for Service Worker, as Matt said. Um, 
It's a new feature implemented in Chrome, um, but it is coming to other platforms. Mozilla have their implementation, I believe, pretty complete, and it's in Nightly's, and they're just uh, waiting to make sure it's absolutely stable. Um, and other browsers have uh, shown great interest in implementing this. Um, so how does this work? Normally, you have a page, and it requests resources, and it just goes to the network to fetch them. Um, with Service Worker, you add a, this intermediary, this script that you've written. And any time the page requests a resource, this could be the initial page navigation. It could be images, scripts, CSS, um, or XHR, or fetch. The Service Worker gets to say what to do. And it can go to the network and go to the server and fetch that if it wants to. But there's also a, a cache API built in with service workers. And that stores request and response pairs. So you can seed that cache with um, the requests for your resources and then the response that you need to give for all of those resources, and just return those instead and never go to the network. Uh, and now, thanks to Platinum Store, you can get the benefits of using Service Worker um, just by adding a couple of elements to your page. Um, so Platinum SW Register here just says, I'd like a service worker in my app. That's not really going to do a great deal on its own, but we configure it by adding some elements inside. Oh, I don't know what happened. So, formatting error. Um, so Platinum SW Fetch <clears throat> allows you to say, how to handle certain kinds of resources. So you see here that we've got this um, path. So any time a resource is fetched that matches this path, um, or this path pattern, um, we, we're going to handle it in a particular way. And you can set these up um, for as many different um, parts of your site as you like. Um, Platinum SW cache, I'm just going to point out um, this bit here first, the pre-cache. This says to the, uh, to the app, as soon as, the, as soon as you load this, I want you to put all of these things into the cache straight away. These are the critical parts of my application. So as soon as I load, put them into the cache so that they are there for the very next time that the page is loaded. So here I've just got, an, as an example, index.html and the uh, CSS file, but you'd put in JavaScript and images and whatever you needed to show probably your home page and maybe the, app, uh, the shell of your app. Uh, and I kind of skipped over this um, before. The, so there's a handler in the fetch, and there's a default cache strategy in the uh, cache element. Um, they're both set here to network first, but that in there you put in um, what you want to happen for these resources. Uh, and the one in the, uh, the default cache strategy is what should happen when uh, the current resource being loaded doesn't match any of your fetches. Uh, so what's all that about? So there are a bunch of different cache strategies built in. Um, network only is the simplest one to explain, because basically the service worker doesn't do anything. It just lets it go straight through to the server. Um, network first will, so for that resource, we try and fetch it from the server. Uh, and if that doesn't work for some reason, then we'll look in the cache instead. This is uh, better than not doing offline at all. Uh, but it's slightly problematic because the, that network connection, if it's just a bad connection, it could take two minutes for that to time out, which would be terrible performance. Uh, so better performance, cache first. If we have that resource in the cache, load it straight from there. Don't even consult the network. That one's um, always going to be much faster for stuff that you've got in the cache. If it does go to the network, then when that's fetched, it sticks it in the cache for next time. So you can use this for um, what we call read-through caching. Uh, and then my favorite one uh, is called fastest, um, which is basically you go to the cache, you go to the network, whichever one comes back first, use that. Um, <laughs> usually, for anything that's in the cache, this will be whatever is in the cache. Um, not always, apparently. Um, but uh, when that network request, because the network request always happens, and it always updates the cache when it comes back, it means that you're, always, you're only one refresh behind. Um, so you're still you're, you're slightly stale, perhaps. Uh, and the, the 
even better one, I guess, is your own thing. You choose the behavior that you need for your application. Um, so we had one that was um, network if fast enough. <laughs> um, so it would, it would try the network, and then there would be a set timeout that just after 500 milliseconds said, no, you're too slow, go to the cache instead. Um, so you try and get the, uh, the thing from the, uh, from the network. OK, so with these building blocks, we can build all sorts of different um, applications uh, or ways of dealing with offline in your application, sorry. Uh, so simple read-through caching. You could set it up so that you don't have any fetch handlers. You have um, a default cache strategy of uh, network, network first or cache first, whichever you like. Um, and that will just, every time a resource comes through, it will try the network. It will have to go to the network first, but then it will stick it in the cache. And then next time, you can get it from the cache. Um, so it will build up the cache as the user goes around. But you don't do any pre-caching. You can obviously pre-cache all your resources, as I said before, so that most of your app works offline straight away. Some resources, you'll have like a huge header image or something like that. Um, maybe you don't want to store um, large resources, videos and things like that in the cache. You so you say those ones are network only. Uh, and you can implement um, fallback uh, media instead so that you, uh, by creating your own handler, you could say for these resources, um, if the network is available, get it from the network. Otherwise, we're not going to bother caching these things. Just you know, send back a thumbnail saying, you're offline, you can't see this, click to try loading it again, something like that. And you can also have user-defined uh, caching. So if you're browsing uh, blogs, uh, blog articles, for example, and maybe they'll have a little button that says cache this to read later. OK, so next up we have um, messaging, uh, push notifications in particular. So these are notifications that appear on your device because something happened on a remote server. Um, some trigger that completely outside the application. Uh, so here we have um, an example of this. There's a, uh, this demo was created by uh, Monica, who's actually speaking later. Um, so here, um, you, you, these are for people who want to receive notifications about cats. And who wouldn't? Um, so you, uh, you toggle the button on, say, I would like to receive notifications. You get a little um, permission dialog in Chrome. Um, which is actually important. We don't allow uh, applications to show notifications unless you have that permission. And that's why we have this UI element, so that the user clicks it, and then they get the permission notification, uh, permission dialog, because then, um, then there's context for that decision. The user knows why they're having to um, click that button to say they want notifications. Um, later on, someone comes along and clicks the Send Cats button. Um, and then later, a uh, notification arrives. Um, and this could happen um, while a device, uh, while Chrome is completely closed. Um, and it could happen um, a long time after. And you get the notification, you click it. And in this case, you get a picture of a cat, which is perfect. Now, how did we achieve this magic? There's an element for that, obviously. Um, Platinum push messaging. Um, as well as sending cats, you could use it for more serious things, breaking news, chat messages, new email, that sort of thing. Anything you get a notification for on your phone already. Um, Platinum push messaging allows you to do the configuration of all this right in your application. The, the server side here is more complicated, and I'm going to just gloss over it and pretend it isn't there. But for anyone who's implemented push messaging on Android, uh, the, Chrome, the setup for dealing with Chrome is exactly the same as using Google Cloud Messaging on Android. A little bit of uh, client configuration at the moment, and we hope this will go away in the future. But right now, you need a, um, a web app manifest file. And in there, you need to have at least this GCM sender ID, which you get from the uh, Google Developers Console. Again, kind of going to gloss over that here. So here's the actual, the actual element. So here we've just defined statically what that 
uh, what those notifications are going to look like. Um, so uh, we've got a title, a body, an image to show, and a URL to go to when we click. <clears throat> um, you can actually set all sorts of other um, things on this notification, like even the pattern of vibration that should be, uh, the device should use when the notification is shown, which is pretty cool. But it's a bit boring to have the same message every time. So instead, we have this configuration option, um, this message URL. This URL will be fetched when uh, it's about to send, uh, pop up a notification. And that will instead have a bit of JSON that describes what the notification should look like. It has all the same options. And this allows you to dynamically make those notifications based on whatever data your server has at the time. Um, here I've got a, a simple URL. It's just um, .json. But obviously, you could put in query parameters or something like that that are specific to the current user so that you can get um, message details that way. There is actually, in the future, you'll be able to just have the element with no configuration, because you'll be able to send a body with the push notification. Uh, but that isn't actually implemented yet. Um, and then, as I say, you, want to, you don't want to actually start subscribing for push notifications without asking the user. So there are a couple of things to do there. Um, I've written this code snippet in ES6 style, as you can see. Um, so we get a reference to the element, and then we hook up the toggle button uh, to a little function that just says, if you've just enabled it, um, run the enable method. And if you've disabled it, run the disable uh, method. Uh, and then finally, when the subscription information changes, we get an event, and we can send that subscription information up to the server, which will then know how to send messages to you. So the final thing in our whistle-stop tour of features is device access. Uh, this one's a bit more experimental. Uh, it's actually it's not even only in Chrome. It's only on Chrome OS at the moment, and it's behind a flag in Canary. But this one's, this one's a bit more interesting, so I wanted to give you a sneak preview. Um, so Web Bluetooth is the API uh, behind this, um, and it allows you to connect to nearby Bluetooth low-energy devices, uh, also sometimes called Bluetooth Smart. Um, and while this is only an experimental API, uh, thanks to my colleague Francois in Paris, uh, there's an element for that already, <coughs> uh, the platinum Bluetooth element. Um, this is, again, pretty simple. You create a, um, a device element, platinum Bluetooth device element. Uh, you, say, you give it a services filter. It just says, I want to connect to some device that, has, that is advertising these services. Um, so here, we're just looking for something that advertises heart rate. And then inside that, we configure it and say, we'd like to know a particular characteristic of those devices. Um, so we say the service is the heart rate service, characteristic uh, body sensor location, which I believe is where on your body you're wearing the sensor. <clears throat> and then we hook up the value of that, uh, of that characteristic just using normal attribute binding. Um, so we can uh, just take that data and put it somewhere else in our app, in this case, in a span. Uh, now, these, uh, these names for the services and the characteristic, heart rate, body sensor location, they look pretty nice. Um, unfortunately, not every device has the uh, services and the characteristics with nice names. So you may have uh, a UUID, a long string of uh, hexadecimal digits. Um, but you can probably find those in the documentation for whatever device you're connecting to. Um, and then, similar to the notifications, you don't want to actually pop up the dialog that says, hey, I'd like, to, I'd like you to choose a device to connect to, um, unless the user is trying to do that. So you get a, a reference to the device element, and then you call request, say so that you'd like to actually talk to it. And then when you want to read, because Bluetooth Low Energy is usually for passive devices, um, the, the values aren't like um, streamed to you. So you have to call read to uh, make that property update. But you could do that in a set timeout or something like that, or when a, a button is clicked. Um, <clears throat> Bluetooth, does, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy does have the concept of notifications, which will mean that you can get an event when uh, the values change. Uh, that isn't actually implemented yet, 
in, uh, in the Bluetooth API. So it's not implemented in the element either. Uh, not all BLE devices are passive, though. And we, there was a cool demo produced um, by a Googler with the Bluetooth API. I just wanted to show you a little bit. So what he did is he got, he got this grumpy cat toy, and he attached some helium balloons to it so that it would fly. And then he took a, put a little Bluetooth chip inside, a little Bluetooth module, and stuck a rotor in its backside. <laughs> <clears throat> and then with this little um, control panel, he then just uh, made it fly around his apartment. Ooh. I apologize for the quality. So. <laughs> it's not as smooth up there as I uh, hoped, but let's just uh, appreciate that for a moment. Um, so that was a whistle-stop tour of uh, new features coming uh, thanks to Polymer. Um, thank you very much. Um, you can learn more about the Platinum Elements at this link here. And there is actually a Web Bluetooth Code Lab available in the Code Lab area. And I believe we have some Chromebooks up there if you want to try it out. So thank you very much.